Abrahamic covenant. That is the covenant that God made with Abraham and his seed way, way back. And uh, uh, we are uh, focusing on that. And last week we uh, uh, read uh, most of the scriptures that had to do with the covenant so that uh, we, we should know by now what the covenant was. That is the wording of the covenant. Uh, the Lord talked to Abraham about a land that he was going to give him. He talked about being, uh, bl- being blessed and becoming a blessing. He spoke to him about um, becoming a father of many nations. He also spoke to him concerning the matter of kings, that both he and his wife would be used of the Lord to bring forth kings into the earth, princes and kings. Uh, God indicated that this covenant to Abraham would extend and carry over to his seed, his seed, a posterity. He told uh, Abraham that uh, his, his seed uh, would be as, as the sand of the seashore and as the stars of heaven. So we feel that in that there's a message that, God, that Abraham would have a natural seed, sand speaking of the earth and of the natural, and he would have a spiritual seed because the stars would speak to us of something heavenly. That may, may not be so, but we, we believe that, that that's what uh, the indication is there. And finally, the last, uh, one of the last verses about the covenant was Genesis twenty two seventeen, 17, where he said, your seed shall possess the gates of your enemies. And that speaks to us about dominion. And that God had, has, is, had called Israel to be a people of dominion. And uh, God worked with them and developed them, and, and they finally became a people of dominion in the days of David and, and Solomon. But then we found, some, uh, we found several amazing verses uh, concerning the seed of Abraham. Will you please turn now to Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3. We found there several uh, illuminating verses about this covenant and in particular about the seed. And uh, the first one is found in verse, uh, uh, verse 16, <clears throat> Galatians three sixteen. <clears throat> Here's what it says. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one. So that's a revelation in itself. And we're told who that seed was. And to thy seed, which is Christ. So that that kind of adds a tremendous perspective on the whole covenant. That God was not just talking about an earthly seed. We know that, that there was a passing on of the covenant to Isaac and Jacob and their descendants. But Christ here in Galatians 3.16, Christ is also brought into the picture. And that somehow back there, way, way back when he gave the covenant, God was referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, in this uh, chapter, the writer by inspiration, of course it was the Apostle Paul, the writer by inspiration uh, makes a very important distinction for us. Uh, and that is in verse 17, uh, he, uh, he says that the law, uh, the law had nothing to do with the covenant. The law could not uh, uh, be a substitute for it. 
The law could not interfere with its uh, uh, fulfillment. The law was just simply added until Christ would come for various reasons. But uh, we need to realize that also, uh, as, as we study this, that Abraham was 400 some years before the law. And so that should make us very careful as to what we mean when we, when we talk about the Old Covenant. Who can remember what we said last week? What is the Old Covenant? What is the Old Covenant? The Mosaic Law is the Old Covenant that is referred to many times in the New Testament. The Law, the Old Covenant. Then the Old Covenant is contrasted with the New Covenant. But so we got to realize that when the Bible says Old Covenant, it's not the covenant of Abraham. See, that's very, very important. It's not the covenant of Abraham. The covenant of Abraham is not old, <laughs> but it is continuing in its fulfillment. It is being worked out in Christ and will have a completion. It will have a fulfillment. Praise the Lord. So we need to make and keep that important distinction that the, the covenant of the law is not the same as the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant was a covenant of promise. It was a covenant of faith. And then we notice here in this chapter <clears throat> an amazing verse that we read near the end of our session last week, if you will turn to it now. <clears throat> in verse 26, let's start there to read. Praise the Lord. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Ye are all the children of God by faith. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, notice the apostrophe there, which means if you belong to Christ, if you belong to Christ truly, then are you Abraham's seed. Praise the Lord. Do you belong to Christ tonight? Through salvation, through repentance, it's the only way. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And, and it puts Abraham's seed on the basis of faith. Faith is the basis for being Abraham's seed. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And not only Abraham's seed, and heirs, heirs according to the promise. So tonight, you're a seed of Abraham, <laughs> amen, and you're an heir according to the promises. What are you an heir of? What are you an heir of? The covenant. You inherit the promises of the covenant. Praise the Lord. You inherit it. And so this is why we're studying this. What has God said about all of the seed of faith? What is our calling? What is our destiny in Christ? This is what we're exploring. We want to know. And just, we would feel that, you know, becoming aware of the fact that we're of the seed of Abraham, it, it, it should make us feel like the Jews have felt down through their history, that they're a special people. They have a destiny. That God's been taking care of them. 
protecting them, blessing them. Is it wrong for us to feel that we're a special people? <laughs> it shouldn't be. It's the way, the way we ought to feel. Not, I don't mean proud. I don't mean, you know, becoming arrogant. But, but it is a blessing, to say the least, to know that we are a special people because of our salvation in Christ Jesus. And we are heirs tonight according to the promises. So you are heirs of the covenant. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, in this uh, page two, uh, <clears throat> we're not going to take a lot of time for the first few uh, sections up there. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, just quickly going over number one, uh, the Bible says Christ was the seed. Christ was the seed. And we want to re you to recall that in the Old Testament story, Abraham was involved with Christ on several occasions. Uh, <clears throat> we believe that when Melchizedek appeared to him in Genesis 14, it was what we call an epiphany. An epiphany. What, what is an epiphany? An epiphany is an, an appearance of deity. An appearance of deity. The deity has the power to take on human form or any form. The deity can appear. And so we believe that Melchizedek could have been an epiphany. Uh, he was a high priest, uh, which had a number of characteristics uh, which are e equivalent to those that are of Christ Jesus. And then in Genesis chapter 18, we remember that there were three uh, three persons who visited Abraham in his tent, and one of them was the Lord, the Lord. That could also have been an epiphany, another appearing of Christ. And so we see, th see there that there was an interaction with, uh, uh, between Christ and Abraham, between Abraham and Christ. And uh, there are several other scriptures that show that Abraham uh, was a man of the Spirit, he was a man of faith. He was a man of the spirit. And uh, what did Jesus mean when he said, Abraham saw my day? Amen. Abraham saw my day and was glad. Uh, I'd have to believe he, the spirit of revelation rested upon him. He was moving outside the circle of uh, the natural. But he went down through history, down through uh, a lot of time, and he saw Christ. He had a revelation of Christ. And so, in a sense, his being was brought into, uh, into Christ, in a sense. Um, the Bible also says that Abraham was looking for a city. Amen? What kind of a city? A city whose builder and maker was God. A city which had foundations. And that was something spiritual. So, you can quickly see here, Abraham was more, much it was much more than just a, a religious man or a, uh, a man with an intellect, but he was a man of the Spirit, praise the Lord, who interacted with this Christ. And then quickly in number two, uh, Christ was also on hand uh, throughout the journeys of Israel. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and 4 says that he was the rock that followed them. Christ, they drank of the... Of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of the water, the living water, and that water was Christ. And then in Exodus 16, 31, there's a story of the manna. And manna, to say the least, is a type of Christ. Then the cloud that was with them throughout all their journeys is certainly a type of the Shekinah glory. And the brazen serpent that you find in, in Numbers 21 and 9, a clear type of the Lord Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. And you had, then you have all the offerings and the blood that was shed down through their history, which God hoped would bring to them a revelation of Jesus Christ. And Paul, uh, 
you see, beloved, you know, we can say we can say this that that God was wanting to bring these people into Christ in their own way, not the same way that we can come into Christ today, but in their way by the Spirit, they could become linked with the Christ and with something spiritual if they would respond properly to the overtures of God. And uh, Christ is all the way through the Old Testament scriptures. He is in every book of the Old Testament. And Paul, the writer, here is is lamenting the fact that they, they were not able to see him. In 2 Corinthians, don't turn to this, but just let me read it quickly here. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 3, we have this verse. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. You see that? That they could read and read and read and read, but they couldn't see Christ. There was a veil over them in the reading of the Old Testament. But they could have. They could have penetrated that veil. They could have become people of faith. And there were those, there were those down through history, through the history of the Old Testament, there were those that can be classified as people of faith. They were people of faith. And we'll, we'll refer to that later, a little, uh, hopefully a little bit later. Uh, all right, so uh, we want to see here how that Christ was all the way through the Old Testament. And uh, God, folks, God has had a purpose that can only be worked out as a people come into Christ, into Christ. Now, there are several passages that we want to explore tonight to underscore uh, the, the truth that we are of the seed of Abraham and that Christ was the seed. So, will you please turn with me to, again, to Galatians chapter 3. Uh, you're still, you should be still in Galatians Galatians chapter 3. There's so much in that. And it's, uh, it's interesting that God, <clears throat> that God should give this, this revelation to Paul when he was writing to the Galatians <clears throat> because they were tending to go back under the law. And so God was giving them these truths and uh, making an effort to bring them into Christ. <clears throat> All right, let's follow along here. Uh, in, in, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Can there be anything more clear? Huh? They which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Are you of faith tonight? Glory to God. If you are, then you are a child of Abraham. And you're connected. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before, that is beforehand, the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So God preached the gospel. Well, how can we interpret that? I believe the only conclusion you can come to there is that that in the covenant, 
and all the covenant promises is the gospel. The gospel, the full gospel, is in the covenant. Because God preached the gospel to Abraham. That's the conclusion that I can come to. God preached the gospel to Abraham, so when he gave him the covenant and the promises, all of that wrapped together, although there were different terminology and all of that, but that was the gospel. Saying, in thee shall all the nations be blessed. And then in verse 9, so then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. How are we blessed? <clears throat> Somebody tell us. How are we blessed with faith, faithful Abraham? <clears throat> <clears throat> yes, in Christ. But what great blessing did he receive? The covenant? Can there be... A, I mean, can there be any greater blessing than the blessing of the covenant? Abraham was blessed by receiving a covenant from God. God picking him out of of Ur of the Chaldees and saying, Abraham, my covenant is with you. I want to bring you into the outworking of a glorious plan down through the ages. And the Bible says that if we are of faith, we are blessed with faithful Abraham. <clears throat> Hallelujah. We're blessed. We're a blessed people. Do we say that? We bring that in there to establish that indeed we, those of us of faith, are of the children of Abraham and that we are of the covenant. Now turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 4. Has anything come to any of you yet? Any comments yet? Any questions? Praise the Lord. We're trying to stay very close to the Scriptures. We want only what the Scriptures say. Romans chapter 4. And let's follow through on all this, and then we're going to try to come to a conclusion here tonight. Romans chapter 4 and verse 11 here. And uh, as you, we start here, know that this is referring to Abraham. And he, that is Abraham, received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. That he might be father, the father of whom? And everybody say it. The father of whom? All them that believe, the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Now, let's just uh, inject something here. What is righteousness? The root meaning of righteousness is a right standing with God. God accepts you. You can be in relationship with him. He will be in relationship with you. And you are one. You are joined to one. The reconciliation is there. Justification has brought you there. And you are kind of counted righteous. You have a right standing with God. God's your friend and you're God's friend. (laughs) Praise the Lord. And you'll walk together. That makes people righteous. Verse 12, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, that would be all the natural Israelites, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. You see how that even the writer here is driving home this point that we're all We're all collected uh, as, as one body of people. Not only the circumcision, but all who walk 
in the steps of the, of, of the faith of our father Abraham. Verse 13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world. Oh, there's a revelation. The heir of the world? <laughs> Blessed are the meek, for they shall what? Inherit the, world, the earth. The Muslim religion has as, it, as its objective the conquest of the whole earth. But glory be to God, I have news for them that one day Jesus Christ will reign over all the earth. Amen? He will be king of all the earth. Hallelujah. And Daniel saw something in Daniel chapter 2, a stone cut out with, without hands, and the stone smote the image, and the image filled the whole earth, and along with that is the saying that the saints came and took the kingdom. Glory to God. So we have a, listen folks, we have a wonderful future. We have a glorious future. And now is a time of preparation for that future. And the earth, though it seems to be decaying, and they talk about global warming, I don't know about that, but there's depletion of various sorts and changes and all of that. But listen, even the earth is going to have a regeneration. Because we look for a new heaven and a new earth. Glory to God. We're in dwells righteousness. Hallelujah. So heir of the world means a lot. But the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham and to his seed through the law. Forget the law. But through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, then faith is made void. And the promise made of none effect. So, see how we need to have our minds cleansed of the idea that, that the covenant of Abraham is connected with the law? No. The scriptures are clear here, and there's a kind of a laboring here uh, by the Spirit to disconnect the covenant from the law. Amen? The covenant is not associated with the law. It is connected with those of faith. And so the covenant is connected more with faith than with law. It's not connected with law at all. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Any comment? Hallelujah. And, you know, I, I trust we're getting the picture here. And, and uh, I'm, be, I'm laboring in this because I feel, well, we can't just make a statement here without studying the full context here of these uh, scriptures which apply. Verse 14, for if they, uh, verse 15, because the law worketh wrath, that is the wrath of God on those who don't keep it, for where no law is, there's no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace, and grace enters into it, the unmerited favor of God. To the end, watch this now, that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that which is of the law, but to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Can there be anything more clear? Amen? Let's all say it. Abraham is the father of us all. Would you please repeat it? Abraham is the father of us all. Amen. <laughs> so when you read the Old Testament and it says, look to your father Abraham, don't say that's for the Jews, it's for you. <laughs> look to the pit from whence you're digged. And every time Abraham's mentioned in the Old Testament, you, you realize, hey, I'm connected with that guy. He's my father way back. And I wish I had some of his faith. <laughs> I wish I could endure like he endured 25 years before his son came. But he was strong in faith. And the faith of Abraham is held up high all through the teaching of the scriptures. Praise the Lord. Well, it goes on to say more about Abraham, but that is enough there. That covers what I wanted to cover there. So now, <clears throat> let's go, please turn to section number four in your outline. And before we get into that, does anybody have a comment or a question? 
Praise the Lord. Anybody. All right. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to just very, very uh, carefully, I'm going to make some statements here. And I want you to hear, hear my heart. The title of section four is The Church is Not a Replacement, but a Continuation of Israel. I've never said that before, I don't believe. And I haven't heard that said. But the reason that I put that in there is that those of us who do not emphasize natural Israel to a great degree and also who uh, take uh, scriptures from the Old Testament and apply them to the church or to ourselves as believers, those of us who do that are accused of what they call replacement theology, blaming us for replacing Israel with the church. And that, so therefore, we're way off base, and we are guilty of replacement theology. Well, in regards to that, I want to say this. I do believe we need to be very careful in the reading of the Old Testament. You know, beloved, as you do in the reading of all Scripture, you need to read by the Spirit. The Spirit's got to be with you when you're reading. And you need to know, and the Spirit will witness to you, what Scriptures are directed solely to natural Israel, and what scriptures are, are of such a nature that we can take hold of them by the Spirit and we can apply them to the church and we can apply them to ourselves. Now that takes some, you know, what we call fine tuning. We have to be fair. We can't do away with, you know, we can't do away with natural Israel. God has something for natural Israel. But I do want to say this, what God has for natural Israel is very much of an unknown to me. And I do not see in its entirety what uh, natural Israel proponents are teaching. So that is our position so that we do not want to say that the church is a replacement of Israel. But I, in, study, in doing this study, I'm going to conclude that, that the church is a continuation of Israel. Okay, in saying that, we better have a lot of scriptures to back that up. Okay? All right, so let's start. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. <clears throat> and let's read carefully. Let's read carefully. <clears throat> Lord, help us. <clears throat> Verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, and you can see immediately that the reference is to the Gentile people, such as you and me, if thou, being a wild olive tree, were graft in where? So everybody read it out of the King James. Among them and with who? Who's them? Israel. 
But is it just natural Israel? I would think it's the Israel of faith. It's the remnant who come into Christ. We're not grafted into the natural, a natural olive tree, but a spiritual olive tree that has its roots in Christ. So I hope that you're with me on that. But the main point is, we being Gentiles are grafted in among them and with them. (laughs) Glory to God. Among them and with them. Not separate, but among them and with them. If thou being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them and with them, partakest of the root, who's the root? I would think it's Christ. Christ is the root of every covenant and the root of every promise. Partakers of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Let's see what it says. Don't boast against the branches, but if thou boast, thou, thou remember, thou bearest not the root, but the root bearest thee. You're being held up by something. Thou will say then, well, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, he says, that's, that's true, because blindness has happened to Israel so the Israelites could come in. I mean, the Gentiles could come in. But it, here's what it says, watch in verse 20. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. Now, does that convince you that the olive tree is a tree of the spirit and the faith? Because when they were guilty of unbelief, they were broken off from this good olive tree. Are you okay with that? They were broken off. What? Of this tree that has its roots in Christ and its roots in faith. They were broken off by unbelief. You and I, by our faith in Christ, are grafted in to this tree of faith and spirit, which has its root, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's the picture, folks, that I get out of this scenario here, that we present to you very, frankly, this is what we see here. And then there's a warning that follows here in verse 21. Uh, Well, let's finish verse 20. For because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by how? By faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Oh, may God uh, increase the fear of God among his people. For it says, if God spare not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. You know, and this, I believe, gives us some insight into the matter of eternal security. Doesn't it give you the picture that you're going to be broken off? Huh? How about it, Nicole? Amen? She's shaking her head. You can be broken off. You know, I don't want to, in this, in this study, folks, we don't want to teach the denominational teachings. We don't want to teach the popular teachings of our day. We don't want to teach our own teaching. We want to hear what the scriptures say. Would you be with me in that? We want to be fair. We want to be honest. We want to be true. And if the scriptures say something different from what we've heard all our life, so be it. Amen. We need to be, you know, honest with the truth. And if we have to stand relatively alone, God give us the grace to stand alone. Paul had a great fight in his, in his whole lifetime to stand with the truth. Any comment? By now, I surely should have stirred up somebody. Let's pass the, the, the mic to, to Todd. It's good to have a break here. Praise the Lord. Don't be afraid now to, let's, to talk into the microphone. No, 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 no. <laughs> All right. Here's the question for you. Yeah. 
I may not have the answer, and I remember. <laughs> now, are, are, they, uh, are they broken off only because they rejected Christ? Basically and mainly, it seems that that's, you know, the whole picture is they were broken off. In other terms, it says they were blinded, referring to the days of Jesus when he came and they rejected him. However, you know, there's throughout Israel's history, I mean, word this carefully, there's a difference between those of faith and those not of faith. There's a bunch of Israelites came out of Egypt, but the old generation fell because of what? Because of unbelief. And the young generation continued because of obedience and faith. So all through Israel's history, and I don't know what all this means, but all through Israel's history, there are those who fell, and there are those who remain linked with the root, which is Christ. Isn't that true? All through Israel's history, this is true. But I would say, in answer to your question, that the breaking off and the blinding has to do with the fact that they rejected Christ. They were broken off. But God allowed this, in a sense. You know, it says they were broken off, they were, they were blinded, so that uh, the Gentiles could come in. Any other questions or comments? Don't be afraid. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This is getting intense, isn't it? <laughs> but don't be afraid of the truth. Praise the Lord. Um, let's finish this chapter, uh, some portions of chapter 11 here. Um, okay, so we're told, uh, you know, be, be in fear lest you be broken off. Behold, therefore, verse 22, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity. They were cut off. But toward thee, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Again, another blow to the doctrine of eternal security. Amen? I don't see where they get eternal security. You can be broken off. You can fall from grace. A question, Vader, or a comment. Just, just, no, that's all right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This is good. Even if uh, um, the Jews didn't believe, would you say that uh, the Gentiles would still be grafted in because he said he should, he should be the father of what? Many nations? Many nations. So that, that was um, also included the Gentile nations. Right. So even if Israel didn't, I mean, if they did believe, eventually be given over to the Gentiles, <clears throat> you think? Yeah, well, th you know, that poses a question that's hard to answer. Uh, but uh, I think that when God gave the covenant, he, that he saw, you know, he foresaw that the, that the, uh, the, the Jews would be blinded and broken off and that the Gentiles would be grafted in. I think he saw that, that that would happen. But you've got to be right uh, because ultimately Christ will be king of all the earth and all will be brought into Christ, at least in, in a way of subjection to him. Okay, so, but I think the direct answer to that is that uh, Israel, you know, going back to uh, uh, the scripture, uh, the Bible does say that, that Israel was blinded so that the Gentiles could be brought in. And in that regard, I, I want to say something here shortly about the fullness of the Gentiles and the fullness of Israel. Uh, let's just finish this portion right here. Uh, <clears throat> verse 23, and they also, that is natural Israel, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. So, again, underscoring, beloved, what is the basis for being a part of this good olive tree? Faith. 
Faith in God, faith in Christ. That's the basis of the good olive tree. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, now let, we come to something here that's, that I want to talk about. For, if, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, before I answer the question here, I have a question. What is the fullness of the Gentiles? And to answer that, we've got to go back into, into the chapter and uh, verse... Um, verse 8, everybody turning to there, please. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that, sh that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith in Psalm 69, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, that is, the salvation of the Gentiles, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So verse 12 talks about the fullness of the Israelites. And verse 26 talks about the fullness, verse 25, the fullness of the Gentiles. Okay? So you look up in the Strong's Concordance to see if the word fullness is the same in both passages, to be honest and fair. Because we want to know what does the fullness of the Israelites mean and what does the fullness of the Gentiles mean. And they're both the same word. Now let me ask you a question. Does the fullness of the Gentiles mean that all Gentiles will be saved? No brainer, right? Really. No. Would the fullness of the Israelites mean that all Israel be, will be saved? Gotcha, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the reasoning process has got us mm -hmm. to conclude all Israel won't be saved. So therefore, what does the passage mean in verse 26 when it says, and so all Israel shall be saved? Now, we need to do some explaining. <clears throat> you look up in Strong's and you find this. And this is very, very important here. You find this. That the word fullness has several me meanings. One of them being to complete, to make full. If you have a glass that's three quarters full, then you fill it up and you're, you're bringing it to a fullness. So this is what the meaning should be and would be in both cases, because you find that in chapter 11, we've got we to labor a little bit more here. And let's look at chapter 11, verse 1. We'll connect this all together. Just stay with me. I say then, chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, now let's be honest with these scriptures. Hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Now people will 
you know, I've heard teachers get a hold of that and say, has God cast away his people? No, God made a promise to Abraham and the natural Jews will, uh, will be here when the Lord returns and they'll set up the kingdom. That's not what that word is saying. It's not saying that. What is it saying? Here's what it's saying. God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Well, what does that mean? Know ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed the prophets and dig down thine altars until I am left alone and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal, the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, let's read the scripture, at this present time, there is a remnant according to what? Everybody say it. The election of grace. So the casting away, he said, has God cast away God's, uh, the, the natural Israel whom he foreknew? No. A remnant shall be saved. Isn't that the answer? Come on now, we want to rightly divide the word. Is, is that the answer? That's what it's saying. Has God cast away Israel? What does he have for them? He has an election. And I would believe this present time is the age of grace. All throughout this history, there will be a remnant of the Jews that will be saved and will be grafted into the olive tree. Amen? <laughs> Amen? Does that sound right to you? So that in this olive tree is the remnant of, of Israel that are, will be saved by grace, and it's the remnant, it's the the portion of the Gentiles. It's the, the Gentiles that will be saved by grace will be in this olive tree also. And so that we will be with them and they with us. And there's a continuation of the purpose of God in this one new man that he's making. Praise the Lord. What does God have for the rest of natural Israel that do not believe? I don't know. I just have to tell you, I don't know. And I do feel that too much is being made of natural Israel in the, in the popular teaching of today, and that we need to be careful. Now, let's, let's complete my thought about fullness. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Oh, praise the Lord. God help us. Lord help us to have the truth. We seek the truth tonight, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is the chapter of the heroes of faith. <clears throat> and you go down through and let's just scan a little bit. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. The heroes of faith, all of those of faith in all time. Verse 4 by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated. Verse 8, by faith Abraham went out. By faith 11, verse 11, by faith Sarah conceived, received strength to conceive. Verse 17 again, by faith Abraham. 
Verse 23, by faith Moses. Verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. 31, by faith the heart at Rahab perished not. And then verse 32 says, What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of, of some others of faith. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms and so on, all the rest down through here. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. All of these are the people of faith. Then, at the end of the chapter, it says, verse 39, And these all, having obtained a good report, through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect or complete. And the picture there is that all down through history, God has been forming what we could call a corporate man. A people of faith, glory to God. A people who somehow tapped in to this glorious one, this Christ. And we're counted as the children of God by faith. Now, the picture is that you add up all of those of faith all down through history, and God hasn't completed his man yet. And he's extending now the gospel to the Gentiles in order to complete his man. That's the picture I get. They without us are not complete. And chapter 12 says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about, with so great a crowd of witnesses, it's almost like they are in the stands rooting for us as we run the race. We're compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us that there might be those who reach the finish line. And that will represent the fullness of the Gentiles. So that both the saved Jews and the saved, Israel, uh, saved Gentiles are adding to this corporate man that God is choosing to have in the earth. As you know, it doesn't mean all Gentiles will be saved, and it doesn't mean all of Israel will be saved. So what does it mean? It means that God is making his man, he's forming his man. By another term, which you, you, you need to accept into your vocabulary, he's, he's forming his man with the election. With the election. You know what? I, I'm going to tell you, I want to tell you the truth. I just feel an awesome anointing inside of me. As I'm talking about these things, I feel like we're touching something in the purpose and plan of God that needs to be uh, conveyed to God's people everywhere that we would stop drifting, we would stop our lukewarmness, that we would stop our playing around, that we would get serious with God and run the race. 
because there's a destiny for us. The word election means there's a work for God, that God has for you to do. It means there's a purpose that he's called you into to fulfill. It doesn't mean you're, called, you're elected to heaven and somebody else is not elected and they'll go to hell. That would be not fair. We don't have an unfair God. But the election means that you, like Esther, you like Esther, you and I, insignificant that we are, are called to the kingdom for such an hour as this to do a work for God. And not only now, but in the days which are ahead, we don't, we don't know. We, it's beyond our understanding and our knowledge of what, will, what may take place in this country of ours in the next year or so or any time. We don't know. There are the prophets of God, Pat Robertson, uh, David Wilkerson, are, are predicting that something major will happen in this country before the end of the year. Something which may necessitate a great number of saviors appearing on Mount Zion to help the needy and to bring the knowledge of God to a people who might suddenly be searching, where is God? Folks, listen, God's preparing you for something. God's preparing you for something. Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Hallelujah. You are gaining the knowledge. You, you are knowing of Christ. You are knowing about the kingdom. You are seeing a purpose greater than just eating and drinking and going through the routine of natural living. You are seeing something way above and beyond that. And when the time comes, God's going to use you to bring many others into it. Glory to God. And I think that's why, that's one of the major reasons why we're studying what we're studying. That you may realize you are called according to a grand and glorious purpose. You're brought into this olive tree. What's this olive tree all about? Is it just being saved and blessed? Is it just going to heaven when you die? No, I believe it's much more than that. There's a purpose. You're a special people to me, the Lord said of Israel. Well, our time has gone by and we've come to the end of the burden for tonight. So please keep hold of this page two. We'll hope to continue with page two next week. Uh, we're, we will start with part B and go down through the rest of this page. But we will take time for comments if you have them tonight yet, another five minutes. Praise the Lord. I, I sense an anointing. I sense the spirit of wisdom and revelation at work in our lives. Hallelujah. I sense the knowledge of God and his ways being imparted in this place. I'm nobody. I'm no nothing. But it's God that set things up the way he has set things up. You may think you're insignificant, but God has a different perspective. Anybody else have anything to say? If there's any doubts, if there's any questions, go to the scriptures that I have prepared for you and look them up and see if they really say what we have presented tonight. Go and search the scriptures and see if they really say what, what we have presented. And we do not say these things with an absoluteness that we are, you know, we have the revelation and we are the people and we, you know, we have everything the way it should be. There's so much in this that, you know, we don't have it all. We, we just have bits and pieces.
But I believe if we walk humbly with our God and are steadfast like Daniel was, if we're steadfast in seeking, the Lord will show it to us. The Lord will reveal it to us. Amen. God bless you, saints. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. And uh, June Regal has requested prayer. The situation with Bob is just not good. Our sister just needs an impartation from the Lord to keep going there in that situation, in that house. Uh, <clears throat> so let's at least...